Our Father in heaven, we gather together today to celebrate the life of our beloved patriarch of our family, our neighbor, our friend, Don Sigurd. We pray that we may celebrate his life and honor his legacy of family, hard work, generosity, We are grateful for the knowledge that he is now with thee, and we pray that we may have peace 
as we grieve our loss. And we are grateful that we had dawn in our lives. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Allie, for that beautiful prayer. Brothers and sisters, I've always been impressed that funeral services are sacred events. It's a time to celebrate and honor and remember the deceased. And I testify to you today that the Holy Ghost or the Comforter will be in our midst. Verily, verily, I say unto you, where two or three are gathered in my name, behold, there will I be in the midst of them. Even so am I in the midst of you. From that scripture, we read, we read that when two or three are gathered, and I might say there are quite, quite a few more than two or three today that are gathered. But if we will ask Heavenly Father today in the name of Jesus Christ, and with real intent, Having faith in Christ, he will manifest to us through the, through the Holy Ghost the truth of things that we have in our heart and questions we may have. The Holy Ghost will bear witness and truth of those things. If we seek him, we'll receive spiritual thoughts, feelings, and communication from heaven today specifically to us individually. So I invite you to partake of the comfort of the Holy Ghost today and to pay attention to those thoughts feelings or promptings that you may have. We're grateful for all who will participate in today's memorial service. We pray that the Spirit of God will be with all that participate, that their words and the music and the prayers will be pleasing to them, to each of you, and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Today's service will proceed as follows. First, we'll hear a life sketch by Sam Sigurd, Don's grandson. Following Sam, we'll hear from two speakers, Shannon Evans, a granddaughter, followed by Greg Carling, a grandson. Don's daughter, Casey Reinertson, will then introduce today's musical number. The musical number will be Autumn Leaves, one of Don's favorite songs, and will be, for, be performed by Charlie Reinertson, a grandson. Following the musical number, we'll hear from Don's son, Kipley Sigurd. We'll proceed to that point. Sam? Good morning, family, friends, brothers and sisters. Today, we gather together to honor Don Sigurd and to remember his eventful life. So, uh, Don was born May 18th, 1930, to John Peter Sigurd and Maureen Prow Sigurd, living his entire life in the Salt Lake area. He passed away September 15th, 2021. He was raised on the family orchard on what would later be called Sigurd Drive. He worked on the family farm starting at the age of 13, driving tractors, hauling produce, and selling peonies for Memorial Day. He attended Granite, Granite High School where he met many lifelong friends, including Glenna Foster, whom he would marry in Elko, Nevada in 1949. This marriage was later solemnized in the Salt Lake Temple in 1963. Don attended the University of Utah, go Utes, studying business. During this time, he built his first home on Morningstar Drive. This was to be the first of many new homes that Don built for his family, mostly in the Olympus Cove area. He owned a masonry company, Don's Masonry, doing residential brick and rock work for 30 years. He invested his income in land and in 1980 was able to turn the company over to a friend and pursue a career in real estate development. Many subdivisions later, Don built a home in the shadows of Bell Canyon where he and his wife lived for 30 years. Don loved the outdoors and taught his children to ski, hike, bike, and water ski. 
Being outside with his family was his greatest joy. However, service in church and community were never avoided. Don was a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was an energetic venture scout leader, young men's leader, high priest group leader, and a valiant home teacher. He served on the Brighton Ski Patrol for many years, enjoying his time on the slopes. In later years, he continued skiing at Alta until the age of 90. He built the gymnasium at the Sports Mall in Murray, which led to a lifetime membership and love of tennis. He played tennis there until 2020 with several of his wonderful friends. Don and Glenna loved to travel and were never intimidated by the dangers of foreign travel. They visited every continent, including the southern tip of South, uh, South America, so they could count Antarctica. They purchased a cabin on Bill's Island in the Island Park, Idaho area. This provided a gorgeous setting for many wonderful family gatherings. Uh, Don showed great compassion and caring for his wife as she pro progressed through Alzheimer's disease. With great devotion, he cared for her and kept her in their home as long as possible. Following his kind example, his daughter Karen took over the caretaking of her, of her dad, for which the family is very grateful. The family is comforted knowing Don and Glenna are now re are reunited now. Uh, we like to thank Aubrey G. Care Center and their staff for the loving care shown to both Don and Glenna. Don was preceded in death by his wife, Glenna, his parents, and his brothers, John and Richard. He is survived by his six children, uh, Karen, Carling, uh, Kevin, uh, Kip, Casey Reinerson, Cami Ramis, uh, Rasmussen, and Corby. 15 grandchildren, 32 great-grandchildren, and his sister, Mary Farley. So the interment will follow at Larkin Sunset Gardens in the 1950 East Dimple uh, Del Road in Sandy. Um, now, one thing that wasn't mentioned in this uh, life sketch was the financial contributions Don has allowed for each of his uh, grandchildren, if they choose to either serve as a full-time missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or if they wanted to, to continue in uh, higher, higher education. Uh, because of Don, Don's financial contributions, um, he has allowed me to uh, attend, a university, uh, attend Utah Valley University and, and to uh, continue going into my MBA program with zero student debts, which I am super grateful for. Um, and before I, I close, I'd like to just share one last thing. So being the youngest grandchild, it has its disadvantages. For one, most of my younger years, when Don and Glenna were basically not really quite in their prime, but they were functional and wanting to go on hikes. That was the moment that a lot of my memories were pretty vague and I don't really remember him, the, the, remember those memories. The only memory I do remember was going on a hike and Glenna only had uh, raisin chewy bars. And uh, I just remember the disappointment I felt biting into, into that raisin chewy bar. Um, but yeah, so there is that disadvantage. But luckily for me, Don and Glenna have been able to uh, come to my, oh, come to my parents' house every Sunday dinner for the past 13 years. And that has allowed me to, to see them in their final chapters in their life and provide with me a lot of great memories that I'll continue to remember. Uh, for example, Glenna having a napkin stuck to her head. We don't know how that happened, but it just happened. Uh, and Don telling me countless times about how Ross Taylor died. I don't know who Ross Taylor is, but all I know is in the next life, I want to meet him. <laughs> I heard he has great hats. And um, yeah. Um, I love you, Grandpa, and uh, I can't wait to see you again. And I, hopefully, I can beat you at tennis and say these things in English best. You know.
Thanks for that. You kind of made me remember the kind of the, I feel like you kind of spoke for how my children feel about their great grandpa. Um, you're kind of the same age as my kids. So I am also very grateful for those contributions for education <laughs> as a parent. Um, I, um, so I don't know if it's because I'm female or if it's because of grandma's very strong personality, but um, I, I think I always, I've always thought of going to grandma's house and i and I consider, oh boy, I really didn't think I'd cry. This has been a tough morning. I think uh, it's tough because it's kind of the end of an era. And I'm, sorry, I'm so very grateful that I can be turning 50. And I've had such a great relationship with my grandparents. Not many people can say that. We went to, uh, we went on vacation sometimes and people always assumed they were my parents. And I just laugh, oh, they're just being so generous. And as I've gotten older, I realize, you know, it's true that, uh, what's that? It's true that not many people can say that their grandparents are 40 years older than them. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, the past few years watching grandpa take care of grandma and, and in his, his, uh, these last couple of years of his decline, I've, I've been thinking more about his influence in my life and the memories I have with him particularly. And, uh, you know, he, he lived fully, he lived, he lived fully, and he, if I could read my notes, I'd tell you what the else he did. <laughs> All right, so he lived fully, and he, and he left a legacy of hard work, loyalty, devotion, frugality, and uh, the importance of education, and enjoyment. Of, of life, and he had, and he, and he instilled in us a global perspective, which I'm very grateful for. He loved gardening, and he was really good at pruning trees. And I, every, every Mother's Day, when my peonies bloom, I, I think of him. And every spring, when I have to prune my trees, I think, where's Grandpa? I need to call him. I need to know how to prune this peach tree because I have no idea. <laughs> and I think of him. He, uh, he loves supporting us in our ambitions. And I think about how his youth was very different than most of our generation. Um, he, uh, most of his children were, and most of his friends were called to Korea. And he says that it's because of the fact that he had a, a child that, that saved him from that. He did go on a couple of cruises in California though. And he says they were like vacations for him. He, he was working so hard morning to night that uh, being called to go out on a cruise ship for the Navy was kind of a little vacation. <laughs> uh, he instilled in us a desire to work hard and appreciate the education that we received. He's known for his wit and his math skills. One time we were at the cabin and he was sitting there drawing out the pitch that he needed for the roof of the at the garage, and I just was amazed. I said, Grandpa, they don't do that by hand anymore. <laughs> and he said, you know, all those years of selling flowers and fruit really helped me with my math skills. And I said, yeah, but you've gone above and beyond the addition. I, I can tell that you, uh, you, you've you got those math skills down. You know, he didn't ever get a formal education. He definitely uh, kept his education up and he, he worked hard too to continue to learn and he was learning until the, until the end. Um, he taught us frugality and I don't remember a time when I was on a ski lift with him, the few times that I went with him, but he would talk about the importance of staying out of debt. And it's something that's stuck with me forever, like that importance of that. He took us to Lake Powell and Flaming Gorge and of course to Bill's Island in Idaho and 
And um, one time he thought of me when he had this boat that was dying and then Ward wanted him to take the boat to, or the youth down to Lake Powell. And, and he thought, well, if I'm gonna take this boat anywhere, I'm gonna at least have one of my kids go with me. So he brought me along and I, it was one of my best memories of, it's really the only time I really remember being at Powell, and um, and uh, it was uh, it was just I got an awesome sunburn, and uh, the the boat died, and it was really frustrating for him, but it was awesome for me, <laughs> and I think I I didn't ever really thank him for um, the work it takes to have a boat, and for the um, all of the runs on that boat. It took me two summers to learn how to walk to solemn ski. Just, I was just not getting it. And he was so patient with that boat, <laughs> running circles around to get us up down those skis. And um, he taught us that there's a bigger world to explore there with their example of their travels. And you know, I teach French and, um, and I teach in an area of the world, Vienna, Virginia, where I have a lot of students who've lived all over the world and they naturally understand what it's like to live outside of where they live. But as a person growing up in, in Utah, and I got to live in Australia, but I, I, I do feel like the, uh, the example of my grandparents and their travels have helped me to have a more global perspective. And I think that's something to not take for granted. I think a lot of um, times that, um, that can that can help you to better understand people and other cultures when you have that kind of a perspective. And I, bet I mentioned the flowers, but he did not like to give flowers. He um, we were in we were in France, and on on Mother's Day, uh, on the on May first, they sell lily of the valley on the streets, and uh, I bought some and I gave them to mom, and it was it was her birthday or Mother's Day, and and I said, Mom. Uh, I don't know if I said happy birthday or happy Mother's Day. And grandpa said, well, why don't I think to ever do that? <laughs> he says, oh yeah, all those years of selling flowers. Maybe I don't think of it the same way, but he did love his flowers in his yard. And, and you, can, you can see those flowers, the, the, the sign of that work in the garden. And it's something that I love too. I know he's happy to be with grandma and I'm, and I'm sure she's already whistled for him a couple of times already. And I'm grateful for the atonement of Jesus Christ. And I'm grateful that it allows us to overcome death. And I want to uh, bear my testimony of, of the Savior of Jesus Christ and for his, his love and for the fact that I know that he's mindful of each of us. And Heavenly Father is thinking of us and, and is wanting to come and wanting to send his comfort. Grandpa felt the spirit most when he was in nature, and I think I'm going to take some time this weekend to get up in those hills and think of Grandpa and see if I can't feel that, that spirit that he loves. Well, until we meet again, Grandpa, we love you. I say his name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank All right, so it's an honor to uh, be able to speak to y'all today. Um, so as I was preparing my talk and thinking about all the people that have uh, meant so much for me in my life, um, Grandpa truly is on the, uh, just a very short list of the people that were most influential in my life. I, I can count on one hand that those people, <laughs> and I assure you he's on, on that list. Um, so I hope my... Uh, talk today can uh, trigger some good memories that you all have for Grandpa and uh, also inspire us all to be just a little bit better in our own lives. Um, so Grandpa was a humble man who loved his wife and was a faithful husband for 70 years. I never heard him uh, raise his voice in the house or at the grandkids or anything like that. Um, he was helpful and went around doing good. Uh, pruning fruit trees, fixing things, and taking us on his boat. He was a hard worker. He earned the nickname of Grandpa Mud through years and years of laying bricks to support his family. 
Uh, he was uh, thrifty, like many who were raised during the Great Depression, um, and teaching us only to buy the staples. Uh, so we can thank Grandma, probably, for the boat, for the cabin, for the trip to, <laughs> trip to Alaska, <laughs> cruises. Um, but even through that, he, he taught us it's okay to spend money when, you know, to keep your family happy or your wife happy. Uh, and then also along with that, um, one thing I'm eternally grateful for is that he taught us how to find money under ski lifts as we <laughs> we'd go in the springtime as the snow's melting away, you walk up to the, the chairlift I mean, and find uh, quarters and coins underneath the chairlift. So uh, he was honest and kept detailed records of his finances. So I have no doubt that he was completely honest in um, his business and in dealing with people uh, day to day. Like I just can't imagine him doing something dishonest. Uh, so he was also a little uh, mischievous. So I love to hear stories about uh, rolling tires down on the cops as they're coming up to get him and he and his friends when they were trespassing in the landfill or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, um, I love his stories about riding his horse bareback from 33rd South to downtown Salt Lake City. I don't think he could get away with that today, but um, so, uh, he's also a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He had a simple and logical testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith. He once told my mom, there's no way a 14-year-old boy could make all that up. I choose to believe that it's true. And so I know that his simple testimony uh, was a great example for us. Um, so the same thing could be said about Grandpa, as was said about Captain Moroni from the Book of Mormon. If all men had been and were and ever would, ever would be likened to Don Sigurd, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yea, the devil would have, uh, would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. Yeah. Okay, so as far as I know, uh, Grandpa's only weakness is that he was terrible at basketball. <laughs> so even, <laughs> uh, even just uh, last year, he was still trying to make a basket. <laughs> and every <laughs> with every miss, you in frustration, would say, come on, Don. <laughs> <You know? laughs> over and over again. Uh, growing up, I'd always uh, brag to my friends about my grandpa. And so even to this day, I'll find myself bragging about uh, my grandpa and his ability to hike and ski and bike, uh, even at an older age. So if you uh, bear with me a little bit, I have three stories I wrote um, as a teenager. So in junior high, thankful, I'm thankful for my English teachers for having us write these things because it really came in handy. Uh, the first story is when I wrote in eighth grade. Um, his thin gray hair does not reflect the way my grandpa feels inside. He doesn't pay attention to these minor defects of aging. When people look at his 66-year young body, they probably think he's old and decrepit. But he is as energetic as a teenager. Under his tough skin lies not only his athleticism, but also his big heart that makes him easy to like. If you talk to him, you'll notice that he doesn't like to be called old. My grandpa's ability to stay young actually started when, when he was a little boy, born on a farm. He found out uh, about hard work at a young age. His early years were hard, but somehow he managed his way through school. After graduating from high school, he attended the University of Utah and married Glenna. After struggling to find a job, he decided to work as a brick mason and build houses. The first house he built was in Salt Lake, where his family of six was raised. As soon as his children could walk, my grandpa took them on hikes and took them skiing. He worked several years on the ski patrol at Brighton and spent countless hours under the hot sun laying bricks. After building several houses and saving his money, he bought a boat so he could take his family water skiing. If you ever see someone who looks too old to be skiing through powder like a maniac, biking where most people do not dare to go, or jumping across both wakes behind a boat, don't be surprised when you find out it's my grandpa. I uh, don't think he's old either. Underneath that thin gray hair is a man who is still young at heart. And then um, another short story here. Uh, one influential person in my life is my grandpa, Don Sigurd. 
Uh, this is also from eighth, when I was in eighth grade. The thing I look up to most is that he is always working and that there's something that needs to be done, he'll do it. For example, my family was over at his house one day and my grandma mentioned that a couple of their trees needed to be watered. Um, while we were moving on to dessert, somebody asked where, was, where her grandpa went. Sure enough, he was outside watering the trees. Another thing he taught me is that old people don't have to slow down. He is 66. So to me, I guess that was, or eighth grade, that seemed really old. So. <laughs> He's 66 and does everything a 20 year old does. He goes on long bike rides, hikes miles at a time, and snow skis and water skis as well as anyone I know. My grandpa has done a lot of things with me that have made my life fun. If you would have not bought the boat and the cabin, I don't know what I would do during summer. He goes on bike rides and hikes with me and takes me skiing, among other things. In conclusion, my grandpa is a great person, and I don't know where I'd be without him. And then the third story here is when I was in ninth grade, also for an assignment for English, but just a story about uh, kind of similar. You'll see some common themes, what I admired in him as a, a kid, but also to this day. Um, my grandpa has always been a tough guy. He does things most people his age only wish they could do. Tennis, walking, hiking, biking, and skiing are all part of his weekly schedule. Lately, he has shown some signs of aging in his 67-year-old body. The most recent examples of his slowing down was this summer when we were planning a backpacking trip to the Uintas. At first, he, was, he said there was no way he would go. His weakening back could never carry a 50-pound pack, he said. But when we said he was a wimp for not wanting to go, his ego got the best of him. He knew that we would lose a lot of respect for him as a tough mountain man if he didn't go on this trip. It didn't take much to convince him that his back was still strong enough to do it. A couple of weeks later, my parents, uncle, cousin, and grandpa piled into the Suburban to seek an adventure. After a two-hour drive, we were on the trailhead saying goodbye to all our worldly possessions. We hiked a few miles through pine trees and quakies until the trail took us straight up the side of a mountain. And we were standing on a huge patch of dirty, melting snow. For miles around, we could see nothing but forests, looming boulder fields, lakes, and streaks of snow. I looked at my grandpa and smiled. I could tell that the crisp, cool air had healed all his pains. He seemed to have forgotten about his sore back and was enjoying the view. After a little rest, our group trudged onward and down the other side of the mountain, dropping into a valley appropriately named Swayze Hole. We pitched our camp at dusk and watched as the sun slid behind the mountain, illuminating the frosty peaks around us before it left. When I woke up the next morning, I could tell I had overslept. Grandpa had been up for several hours and had already made a fire and said he had been out exploring the area. After a hot breakfast, we grabbed our poles and headed to the lake. Uh, Grandpa and my uncle had been telling us about the millions of fish they had caught on previous backpacking trips. I didn't believe half of their stories, and I was curious to see if we'd catch anything except seaweed. Sure enough, the fish were biting our worms, and we ended up with enough fish for lunch. Um, so we spent two more nights at that camp before it was time to go home. The trip was a major success, and it gave my grandpa something he could brag about to his friends. He proved to everyone that he is still young at heart and can do things that require a lot of work. I'll never forget this backpacking trip with my grandpa. And I hope there will be more trips next year and the year after and so on. We'll just have to see how that old back holds up. So I'm uh, grateful to have my grandpa in my life all the way till uh, age 40. Um, I hope I can be like him when I'm 67 or 91. And uh, it's been hard to watch his health decline over the, his health decline over the last few years. Um, but, uh, but now that he's passed away, I know this is a, uh, a necessary step and that we'll see him again. Um, so through the atonement and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, I know that uh, families can live together forever. So this gives me comfort to know that he um, is back with grandma and that I'll be able to talk with them again someday. Um, so, and the scriptures also tell us that my grandpa will have all his hair back and a strong back again one day. So in the Book of Mormon, we read, um, this just in closing here, now there is a death which is called the temporal death, and the death of Christ shall loose the bands of his temporal death. 
that all shall be raised from this temporal death. The spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form. Both limb and joint shall be restored to its proper frame, even as we are now at this time. Now this restoration shall come to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, both the wicked and the righteous. And even if there shall not be so much as a hair of their head be lost, but everything shall be restored to its perfect frame as it is now. So I'm so grateful uh, for grandpa and uh, so grateful for his example in my life and just to be able to have him for, for so long. And I, um, I love you, grandpa. It says in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We chose Autumn Leaves for the musical number today because that was my dad's all-time favorite song. And it became especially, you know, I didn't think I'd cry either, come on. Um, it became especially meaningful the last few years because the whole time my mom was at Silverado, he would visit almost every single day. And he, um, would always time his visits to be there for the musical number at three o'clock. And uh, his very, both of their favorite performer was Maggie Beers, who was a good dear friend of mine from high school. And uh, no matter what the program was, whatever the, the season, he, dad, she would always ask if people had any requests and he would always request autumn leaves. And uh, even, you know, if her program was in the spring and it was about birds, <laughs> you know, that was his request. And then a John Denver song for mom. So uh, today, one last request. Um, this time, <laughs> sorry. This time performed by my son, his grandson, Charlie Reinerson. <laughs> Oh, Charlie, why did you do that to me? <laughs> he is talented. I said I wouldn't cry. It's too late now, Charlie. Uh, I do have a bone to pick with Greg, though. Man, you have made me feel older than I've ever felt. <laughs> At 65, thinning hair, thinking I'm still 20. And we are really close. We've been very close, but man, I'm cutting you off. <laughs> and I can sure flesh out a lot of the stories he told with some little extra details, but I know I'm on a short fuse here. Um, I am very grateful to be back in my neighborhood, my ward house, 
with my family sitting out here. My dad developed the subdivision just to the east of us here, and it, it was a wonderful place to raise my family. And I, I see all friends here and incredible neighbors. And uh, I, I know I didn't see all of you as you came, and I didn't see the Rasmussens, some who were incredibly involved in dad's care after mom passed. And, and all of you know who you are. You're great neighbors from uh, in Fur Hollow Drive who look the Calders, the Frishes I see. Who am I missing? Raise your hands. <laughs> You're, you've all been angels to my dad. Um, and helping my sister to do the impossible, which is to care try to, uh, you know, alone care for an aging parent, which is asking a lot, and especially when uh, dementia sets in. I had a lifelong dread of losing my dad. And, the, and, uh, <clears throat> and I kind of blame my English class in high school, where you did such nice writing. We had to, we had to listen to a poem by this miserable Dylan Thomas. Uh, Do not go gently into that good night. And if you all remember this poem, we had, to, we had to hear him say it, this Welsh author, do not go gentle into that good night. And then we had to write an essay on it. And, and it does go, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at end of day. A rage, rage at the closing, uh, rage, rage at the closing of the day, is it? Rage, raised at the closing, I knew I would mess it up. But I, back then, I really grabbed onto that poem, which I don't do much. I kind of thought, this is an emblem of what I want from my dad. I want him to, I just want him to fight and rage and never die. And I don't want to lose him. And I remember talking to uh, a friend in medical school about who had lost a parent and a close parent. And I said, how, how do you ever cope with this? How would I ever, and I specifically thought of my dad, how would I ever cope with losing my father? I, I, he was the single most influential person by far in my life. Um, and I really adored my father. Why did I adore my father so much? You've heard a lot of the reasons. Um, when I, to put it into words, there, and Greg would get this because Greg's kind of been a quiet tranquil guy. Uh, my dad just gave peace. He, he, we are very different people. And they say opposites often attract. And my dad was peaceful. He was calm. Um, he, I can't remember him ever raging. Uh, he, I, I can't remember him getting mad at people. This, this was not my dad. Um, so in that, in that great theme of nature versus nurture, I guess I, that nature, genetics, didn't flow my way with my father too much in that regard. My kids will attest to that. Uh, so uh, as my life has gone on, you know, I'm going to make another quote. I know I'm going to mess it up, so excuse me for my little computer here. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Okay, idiot. Um, <laughs> I love Bonnie Raitt, Hall of Fame blues singer. Uh, she had a platinum, multi-platinum album, Nick of Time. And the, the song, The Nick of Time, has that lyrics that always grab me. And one of them is, I see my folks are getting on, and I watch their bodies change. I know they see the same in me, and it makes us both feel strange. No matter how you tell yourself, it's what we all go through. Those lines are pretty hard to take when they're staring back at you. And I, I love Bonnie Ray, but um, I, I, I always felt that strangeness, strangeness. And, and I guess I realize now that my grandchild, my two grandchildren sitting here are gonna write essays about dad's thinning, go past thinning hair and, and his back pain and his wanting to do more than he can do. So, uh, yeah, so she got it right. And it, I think with a parent who has dementia, you pass pretty quickly through stages of grief as they're living. You've passed uh, disbelief, you, you've, you've passed anger, 
you have jumped ahead, uh, you, bargaining, you pass bargaining, D-A-B. The next one is depression. And finally, there's what? Acceptance in the end. Um, so I'm kind of, I've kind of been hung in depression, kind of waiting on pins and needles, always waiting for the call to come. I always thought it would come from Karen's phone. Um, I knew I probably wouldn't be here, given that I live in Coopville, Washington. Uh, I kind of accepted that I wouldn't be here for him. Um, so, and I didn't, it was a quiet acceptance the day I, I had kind of an inspiration. I, call, I talked to Casey a lot on the phone and I called her in the morning that day and she said, I just got off the call, off the phone with Albert and dad has passed. And she said, well, he, he's had another one of his seizures. And after his seizure, he, uh, the nurse held his hand and, and uh, they, they fall into kind of a semi-conscious state after and, and he'd had him before. And she just said, Don, you can go, it's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was always an emotional speaker. Uh, uh, how much comfort is, the, is there in that story, though? I had prayed for a painless exit for my dad, and it was, it was that. Well, <clears throat> I want to talk about Josh Groban lyrics. I'm into musicians, songs make me think of my dad. You guys all know, my wife says I have a crush on Josh. And uh, she's probably right. He's the one I want to sing like. She always says, oh, you got to go for the Italian. And uh, what's his name? Blind and beautiful singer. And But I, I'm a Josh fan. And that song you wrote about You Raise Me Up, kind of... Uh, you know, to stand on dad's shoulders, be the, you know, be the best you can be. I didn't always do that, but I sure climbed on his shoulders a lot. I had a lot of phone calls to my dad through the years, wanting his opinions, wanting his guidance. And it wasn't about bricklaying. It wasn't about masonry. Um, my parents had, had garnered a lot of experience with life's hardships. They were not immune to some challenges that would have tested a family in a big way. Probably busted up 99% of families and they, they endured it all 70 years of it. It couldn't have been easy. So I, I had some notes about, you know, really important features of my dad. And, and, and Greg and, and Shannon have hit on these. Um, dad was quiet, calm and kind. I never saw my dad road rage ever as I thought about that. To me, it's just right there in my back pocket. Uh, I don't do it where I live now because you just don't drive. You just, anyway, uh, I never, he didn't know what the middle finger salute was. He didn't, I didn't hear him cuss. He never treated us with sarcasm. And he accepted things so calmly. I, I remember going to him once and saying, Dad, we're not horribly disappointed that I, I chose one sport that makes no sense to pursue and dump football. Weren't I, wasn't I not a huge disappointment to you? And he just looked at me and said, what? No. He said, your sport allowed me to be the CDL driver who could jump up and drive the Snowbird ski bus to Sun Valley with Casey and we could we could have one of the greatest experiences of my life was staying there. The ski race was delayed a couple of days with heavy snows. He said, I wouldn't trade that for the world. Ski racing is an insane sport. Uh, I'll give you that. I should have stayed with the typicals, but uh, dad was a reliable doer. And, uh, and when he gave his word, he did it. When he, he kept commitments. And when they said in the obituary, that he was a valiant home teacher, that was all about not just checking the box and going. And, and, I, and that's coming from a guy who hated home teaching. Uh, <laughs> and I was so happy when they kind of pushed the 
that issue away. But my dad did it for the love of people. And he loved his home teaching and he loved his families. And he loved ski patrol. And he didn't start at Brighton, he started at Gorgosa. And he was way too good a skier to be hanging out at Gorgosa. But he loved his friendships, the commitment. Gorgosa is being reborn now as a training slope for crazy stuff. Uh, it, it now, it'll have a life again. So if you ever drive up Parley's, but he went over to Brighton Ski Patrol. He made a bunch of friends, was always committed. He didn't know show his tasks there. Um, dad had an incredible work ethic. Um, I worked summers with dad along with my older brother, Kevin. And there, there have been only, they are the two people that I've seen the hardest amount of physical labor done in the shortest amount of time in my lifetime. My older brother I, and my dad. And my dad was, was more focused and goal-driven and knew the next step, 10 in advance. My brother was more, oh, he was like a wild tornado. And it was, you know, he wanted the job done and he and to be way ahead of everything. But, so I really respected watching my dad on the wall and working and, and watching him come home late at night and sit in a room with a little, with his little tin key thing and doing his bookkeeping himself doing his payroll late into the night, doing his bids and getting on the phone and doing his bids. He didn't, he didn't resource this to somebody else to do. He did it himself. And this I saw all through my growing up years. This is the same guy who in his early 20s would build his first home on, on Morningstar Drive. That home is still there. And I drive by it. it. It's a beautiful home standing there. And it's like, how did he do this in his early 20s? I don't know. Um, Dad had a great love of others and it, it proof, proof in how he looked after my mom and showed up. It, I would take him on a hike up around Silver Lake and Dad would start looking at his watch about every 20 steps. And it's like, Dad, what are you doing? Why do you keep looking at your watch? We got to get down to, we got to get down to what was called Silverado. We got to go get there for mom and we got to go hear Autumn Leaves with the singer, our friend Maggie. So he was so, so caring to my mother. I'll never forget that. Um, to, I've said this not often to, to the family of Jack Sigger. Dad loved his, his brothers and, and, he, and his sister, and he highly respected their education. And I think in regards to Jack and Dick, he felt that they were kind of intellectually way up there. You know, if you're going to be a rocket scientist and his older brother and Dick, very accomplished in his field, dad, dad, dad revered his older brothers. And I can say the worst grief I ever saw out of my dad in all my childhood was the day he picked up the phone in the basement of our Gary Road home and burst into uncontrollable tears, which that wasn't Donald. And uh, that was the passing of his older brother. So that was a grief I only saw once in my dad's life, and that was the worst. And as a, as a son, I sat there saying, what happened? I felt like a train had hit my dad. Um, dad was, it was touched on how honest dad was. To a fault, my dad was honest. His dealings were handshake dealings. And what does that say F for in the modern era? Affinity fraud. Dad got taken a few times. He didn't want to get involved with attorneys. He wanted to shake hands and he would do what he said he did, but it did bite him and, and he was so generous. So he didn't quite fit into that part of the modern world. Dad made friends for life. And we've heard stories of these people, the Treglon brothers, Granite High School, Ross Taylor. He made canes out of animal parts. <laughs> I have a shoehorn made of one of those canes. You can guess what, what part of the bowl made a great cane. Um, the Sorensons, I heard a lot about the Sorensons from his childhood, and, and he kept his friends from that, that era. And that's hard to do, because I've gone aged and seen how hard it is to keep friends for life. And a dear friend showed up here. I don't see him in the audience now, but I was. it's so... Dear to me that some a friend would, oh, I see him, 
And he's a, a man I know, Clay Grosbeck, who loved his father, and I loved his father, and uh, revered him. And, and uh, so my dad was strong, physically strong. He, he was not built like me. He was built like my brother, Corby. But Corby, I'm sorry, he was stronger. <laughs> I, I worked alongside him those summers in high school. He could take a flue tile and build a chimney about as fast as anyone. And his chimneys, if the house burns down, you'll see his chimney there for a hundred years or more. And I see him on my island sometimes. Well, look at that. And I always think of my dad. That looks like a chimney my dad built. But he could, I would lift a flue tile, 50, 60 pounds, 70 pounds, some of them were heavy and some lighter. But I would lift them up on the scaffolding, my brother and I. He'd get them on that level and lift them above. And my dad would pick it up with one hand, raise it up and mud the bottom of it, raise it up and stick it down into the chimney stack. One after another, say 30 flu tile would go in there, lifted one-handed. And, and so I knew he was that strong and he remained that strong even to that dear old age of 65, which I am. And, and uh, I know, and he, would, he loved Jack Lane. And I think Mary could probably tell me more about how this affinity started, but he went down into his basement and had a, he had exercise equipment that got used. They weren't clothes hangers and clothes dryers and they weren't rusted every day. And as he got older, my last few visits here in May, he would come huffing and puffing up the stairs. And I honestly thought I was going to be doing I wouldn't have done CPR, but I thought he was going to go down right there and then. And he loved his exercise. Um, he always wanted me to do more of it. And, but he, you know, my dad never, never pushed, never. He was very smart and they touched on that. He, he could do estimates and calculations all in his head, square footage, uh, number, his estimates were very spot on. I rarely had to haul brick back to interstate brick. Uh, on an overshoot or anything like that. He, he just, he was very sharp. He had an accountant's brain. Um, he was very forgiving. One time at work, I have to tell this story of, he had heavy equipment there and I was a very arrogant 16 year old kid. And I thought I could do anything. And Kevin was more uh, restrained. And of course, I jumped on the forklift. It was a two-story post office we were building. And during the course of the day, I got a little inattentive and I tipped that forklift into the wall they were putting up, block that was to be followed on the uh, veneer of brick on the outside. And the masons were on the inside and I caved the wall in on them and inadvertently, uh, accidentally. And, and we injured uh, one of dad's masons. Dad jumped up, grabbed the mason, ran him to the hospital where he was sutured and repaired. His friends, all his other masons were joking that I had, why did you, you, you did that on purpose because he's a Jehovah's witness. And, and I said, no, I did not. He was, he was the kindest, nicest man of, of the group. So, oh no, it wasn't about that. And uh, I thought dad, my family will tell you that I would have lost my cool. I would not have been crazy. I, Dad just said, you know, maybe you weren't ready for that. I'm sorry that happened. And, and maybe maybe we, we let you go too quick on a fork <laughs> managing heavy equipment. And he was so right. <laughs> but so that was my dad. I, I don't know how he could have stayed so calm. Um, where am I? So strong, smart. Um, I got out of, I got carried away there. Forgiving. Talked about the fork with generous. My my uh, grandkids. Sam touched on how generous he was. He was so generous. Frugal with himself is the key, but generous to any of you. If you would have wanted the shirt off his back, he would have given it to you. He has paid for missions. Gave ed established education accounts. And my example is a funny one where he, he, he bought his cabin at Island Park and there was this little green boat there with, with a, a nest of mice in the, in the engine compartment, the bilge. And he kind of knew it wouldn't last as a boat for the cab and it was underpowered little. So I wanted to buy it and I bought it for $2,000. And that little boat was my family's little boat for a few years. 
until I realized it was everything my dad said it was. <laughs> so when I went to sell it, I sold it to a man at Island Park for $3,000. And I went to my dad and I said, Dad, you, you deserve this extra $1,000 back uh, that, I, that I've made on this boat. And of course, my dad just laughed at me, like, good for you. And uh, he gave me the down payment on my first home, $5,000 coming from him back way back when. And uh, no notes, no promissory notes, no promise on when I'd pay it back. And this was my dad. Um, so he, he had, we could go on and on. And I look out at the audience and I know you all have experiences and memories that could fill this room with stories. And we could go on and on and on. Um, I want to keep the best memories uh, there. And, and I want to have a photographic memory of my dad hunting and, and going on hunts with me. And first one where Kevin and I were there, my brother and my dad walked out in the early morning and like my, my grandpa was there. Dad walked out of the tent, walked about 200 yards, boom, boom, boom. He filled three tags and it was over. And my, my brother and I went back to the tent and we got on the tow goat and we rode on the trails the whole afternoon while dad took a long nap after what he'd done. <laughs> and I remember my last deer hunt with dad 1983, we hiked in the Stanbury Range with backpacks and our guns, got it way up to 11,000 feet looking over a meadow. And dad, of course, was an early waker and he, I heard him kip, kip. in the morning hours, the sun's rising over Snowbird. We can see right over the top of the Wasatch out there. You're looking over, right over the Oakers to the east. I said, come out here, come out here, you gotta see this. There's a whole herd of deer below us, big bucks, does, fawn. I mean, it, it, all below us, just sitting ducks like they were in a pan. And he looked at me and he said, which are you gonna shoot? And I looked at him and I said, which are you gonna shoot? And we kind of said, we're a long way back here with backpacks. We don't really wanna shoot one, do we? And we literally just, that was our last, my dad's last hunt. And my last time, we didn't shoot anything. My, my, my daughter, Alec, and her husband would be so disappointed in us. <laughs> so it was my last hunt with my dad. Uh, I think of my last skiing, I want to keep really, I skied a ton with my dad. I watched him crash, amazing crashes. And uh, he once said I led him into one of them, like leading him off a cliff. And he, he literally was, I looked and he was upside down flying through the air. Um, but we skied at Sundance, and this will touch on frugality. He, he never stopped for lunch the way affluent people ski. In the lodge at Deer Valley, having a three-course or five-course dinner, he went to his truck, warmed it up, and ate his lunch in it with us. But on that day, Kay and I took him to the little cafeteria at the top of the mountain, and we had hot chili, and he was... He just like, oh, this is so good. And it was, you could just tell it was like a new experience to not ski the fruit away. And he skied like a maniac that day. He just kept, he will attest to it. And it was my first time ever at Sundance, which was, and we loved it. Uh, boating and water skiing, they talked about. My dad laid down a solemn water ski into his 80s. Uh, I quit skiing a few years ago because of that back that's, that uh, Greg's been talking about, those sore backs. So, Oh, Greg. Backpacking. I kind of lit a fire in backpacking with my dad. Um, he, had, he had gone hunting with others and stayed in giant hunting tents with stoves and all that. But I had gone to the Wind Rivers with him with backpacks. And we, he loved that mountain range beyond the Uintas, the Wasatch. Area. He loved the Wind River Range. And, and it grew in me in Wyoming. Um, and we, and we love that range. We made multiple trips to that range. I'm a little surprised the grandkids didn't talk about dad's nine lives. He burned through 15 and, uh, we, he and I shared one of those events. And I, I hate to spend a lot of time on this, but dad and I, and, I, and his, the plumber that worked for him at the time hiked deep into the mountains and dad was always in the lead going like a maniac. He could out hike all of us with those 50 pound packs. We were coming out and we were, we were making headlong for the truck. We had about six miles to go. We got caught in a huge alpine meadow in a massive and abrupt storm. Um, and it came on so quick. There were some cows 
around. There was no shelter and it, it started to hail. It progressed to rain, hail mix and lightning. And it never in my life again, I doubt I will ever see lightning like that all around us. And we, we had no place to find shelter. I'm not sure, we broke every rule in the book. I, I finally was so wet and cold, you know, 20 minutes into this, that we, I threw up my tent and we all got in the tent together. We had every reason in the world to all die in that tent that day. When we finally came out, I was looking around for dead cows. I thought there's gotta be some dead cows because there were so many bolts of lightning. There were not. And I, I must have been hypothermic and confused. And, and I, was, I was barely making it hiking along. And we went about a mile and hit a stream. And I fell over backwards in the stream. Dad and, and the plumber had to literally pull me lying in the stream up to my feet. I'm wet. I'm tired. I'm probably hypothermic. And we pitched a tent. And Dad, I remember Dad very, being very calm and saying, and he's probably 55, saying, Kip, you know, you... You and I wish I remembered his name. You guys make a fire. I'm going to go down to the lake. And typical dad, he, he was not a great fisherman. And he was not always successful. But he always seemed to show up with a stringer of fish at the right time. So we ate all these fish. The next morning, the sun came up. I was a different person. We got ourselves out of there. And we had a, he never forgot that hike. I can tell you that we, we talked about it long after Dad loved mountain biking and bicycling, and we rode bikes the last time in May. And Casey and I will both attest to the fact that Dad shouldn't have been riding bikes at that time. He was veering into the coming traffic, and we thought, man, we're going to lose into a bike crash here. Uh, and when he mountain biked, his, his habit was to ride along and look at scenery. And we used to ride a trail about, that's now wilderness area, and he'd be riding along. And maybe behind me, and I'd look back and it's gone. And it's because he, he'd look at scenery and his front wheel would go off the trail and he'd fly over the handlebars down the mountain. He never, he didn't really get hurt much doing that, but I, it happened over and over. It's like when I took him to Slick Rock, I said, Dad, if you do that, you're going to die. And uh, so I really held him to it. Um, I'm going to pass on other things. I got to shorten this up. I've kind of rambled a little bit. I'm very grateful. Uh, for many things. I'm grateful that my sister Karen stepped up to care for my mom and dad in the Fur Hall neighborhood and very helpful. Uh, I mean, very grateful to my sister Casey that she would come from Michigan to join me to do some of the hard things and very grateful that I retired in a timely way before my mom and my dad's passing because that allowed me to do multiple, multiple trips down here and have quiet time with my dad taking care of him. And I can't tell you how many times the two of us watch tennis matches and he made me love watching tennis. We, I love the sound of music, favorite musical. I served a mission in Austria and we must have watched the sound of music 20 times in the last six months. And dad, I don't think dad remembered that we just watched it the day before. <laughs> of course, I, I just love the musical. Uh, I'm grateful for the neighbors, and, and I said that already. So as I, I didn't, I stumbled a little bit on this talk, but I can tell you there's a lot of gratitude. And I would like to tell that, that crazy author, Dylan Thomas, that he got it all wrong. My medical training, my experience over 35 years as a doctor told me that uh, American aging people age 65 and over need, they don't often talk about death and they don't plan for death and dying, which always frustrated me because I would get the octogenarian, 80 year old, 85 year old, broken hip, and their family had never thought of what comes next. They hadn't thought about the mortality of treatment and that they're likely to go into a care center. They may not come back out again. And uh, so I was, we, there are some living and more so some dying lessons in this life that just aren't taught much. But for my dad, I, I wanted him to go gentle uh, into that night. I didn't want him to rave and burn hot. I wanted him to smile and greet it. 
even if it meant he had to be postictal from a seizure, I wanted him to go gentle. Uh, I did not want him to break a hip. As an orthopedic surgeon, that was my big nightmare. So I'm so grateful. Father in heaven did answer a prayer. Say the name of Jesus Christ. We're so grateful to each one who has participated in our service today. It's been amazing. We thank each of the speakers, those who participated in the music and the prayers. After my brief remarks, we'll sing as a congregation hymn number 86, How Great Thou Art. And the benediction for this service will be offered by God's grandson, Cole Sigurd. After the benediction, we'd invite the pallbearers to come forward. And as I read the pallbearers' names earlier, I failed to mention Ben Holmes as a pallbearer. So Ben, would you please come forward at that time as well? The interment will be at Larkin Sunset Gardens. It's located at 1950 East Dimpledale Road. At the cemetery, the, the dedication of the grave will be offered by Nate Carling, another of Don's grandsons. We'd also like to thank the members of the Bell Canyon Ward Relief Society for providing a luncheon for the family. Immediately after the interment, the luncheon will be held here at this building, but will be outside in the pavilion directly behind the building. I have a personal creed dealing with funerals, and that's very simple. It's don't miss the funeral. And I'm so grateful today because often, and today is certainly the case, I learned so much about a person at their funeral that I didn't know before. And I've lived in the neighborhood with Dawn for 22 years, and there's so many things I learned today, and my heart's been touched. I felt the spirit of Dawn in a different way today than I'd felt it before, and my heart's filled with his spirit. I'm blessed to be here today and to feel of that radiating spirit, as I'm sure most of you are. I remember well also being with most of you a couple of years ago to honor the life and passing of the matriarch of this family, Glenna. And my personal conviction is absolute and sure that Don and Glenna have been enjoying a beautiful reunion these last 10 days. As I met with many of you and introduced myself, I tried to express my sorrow for your loss, but the overwhelming response was, oh, thank you, but it's okay. He's in a much better place. And Greg reminded, uh, Greg reminded us a little bit about that place. I felt an assurance that you knew when you told me that, that the words of the prophet Alma in the Book of Mormon are true. What he said, the spirit and the body shall be reunite, reunited again in its perfect form. Both limb and joint shall re be restored to its proper frame. That will happen. I bear you that same witness through the suffering and through the atonement of our Savior, Jesus Christ, each of us will be resurrected. Our spirit and our body will be reunited again in its perfect form, just as Don's and Glenna's will be. What a great blessing it is for us to have this understanding in our lives. It allows us the knowledge to feel peace and comfort as we gather to pay our respects in memory of Don today. This knowledge provides us assurance that we'll see him again. It also gives us knowledge that we may grow up with him again. At times, as we contemplate death, either our own death or that of a loved one, we may ask ourselves and wonder, have I done enough? It's my personal witness today that Don Sigurd has done enough. I give you my personal assurance that Don will be transitioned and has transitioned to a place called paradise, a place where the spirits of the righteous go after death on this earth. The prophet Alma taught, the spirits of those who are righteous are received into a state of happiness, which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace, where they can rest from all their troubles, from all care and sorrow. It's my personal witness today that our dear friend, father, grandfather, has been received into that state of happiness, which is called paradise. He now rests from all his troubles, all cares, and all sorrow. 
He is happy and he's looking down upon each of us, but particularly down upon his amazing family. He's looking down as a ministering angel with protection, with love, with peace, and with comfort. And just as Don greeted Glenna and many other loved ones, was greeted by Glenna and many other loved ones on the other side of the bell, I promise each of you in the Sigurd family that he will be there to greet you when that time comes. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We'll now have our closing hymn in prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to have been here this morning uh, to celebrate the life of Don Sigurd. We're grateful for his memory, and for his influence, and for the many wonderful characteristics that he showed. Um, grateful for his love and his kindness. We're grateful that uh, he had a reunion with Glenna. We're grateful for the memories that we hold of him and ask. That would please bless uh, the family with peace and comfort as we proceed to uh, the funeral. We're grateful um, for thy son, Jesus Christ, and for uh, the atonement and uh, the plan of salvation and how that can bring us uh, peace and comfort in this, in this time. We love the Heavenly Father. We're grateful for our many blessings uh, and for our family. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Cole, for that beautiful benediction. Will the pallbearers now please come forward? And will the audience please rise? Thank you, brothers and sisters. This concludes our service.